All right, in this lecture, we're going to do a discussion on uh, healthcare epidemiology. So, as a healthcare provider, what do you need to do that is going to help you understand how disease is transferred and what resources will you have? <clears throat> so, we're going to talk a little bit about healthcare associated infections, infection control, and we'll also talk about organizations that help us track those infections. So epidemiology is the study of how diseases happen, what determines how they're passed from one person to another, how they're distributed and found in different areas and different settings, and also how we pass them on in healthcare settings. In healthcare epidemiology, we're primarily trying to prevent the infection from one person being passed on to other people, whether that be the healthcare provider or the patients we're taking care of. <clears throat> so this includes all sorts of activities designed to help improve your patient outcomes. So infectious diseases can be divided into two categories. The ones acquired within a healthcare facility and those acquired outside of it. Those we usually call community acquired infections. Like we talked about last time, there are two versions of MRSA that we typically talk about. The healthcare associated versions which are usually relatively easy to handle, and the community-acquired versions, which are usually much, much more virulent. <clears throat> of approximately 40 million hospitalizations each year in the U.S., 2 million of those will, will acquire healthcare-associated infection. <clears throat> Many of the common bacterial causes include things like uh, Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus aureus, and the uh, Enterococcus species, uh, E. coli, Pseudomonas, and Enterobacter and Klebsiella species, which tend to either cause digestive or respiratory disease in people. Sources of these pathogens are often healthcare professionals or other healthcare workers, but even more commonly, it's the patients themselves or the visitors that come to see them that pass these diseases on to new patients. Uh, a large percentage, two-thirds of these, will involve drug-resistant bacteria. Urinary tract infections account for the largest number of these, followed by surgical site infections. Lower respiratory tract infections in people who tend to be <clears throat> immobile and rarely, uh, much more rare than all the rest of them, some sort of septicemia. Gastrointestinal diseases caused by C. diff also seem to be on the rise. The thing that puts you at risk for developing a healthcare-acquired infection tend to be the same things that make you more susceptible to infections in general. Very old, very young, pregnancy, um, premature babies and newborns are very susceptible. If you have burns or recent surgery, Diseases like diabetes, cancer, and anyone who would be taking an immunosuppressant therapies um, or steroids would be more susceptible. And then if you're paralyzed or immobilized for the simple reason that moving around actually helps you expel a lot of respiratory pathogens. <clears throat> Three major factors that contribute to are combined to cause healthcare associated infections. We keep seeing a number of drug resistant bacteria going up. The failure of healthcare personnel to follow the guidelines of infection control, and more and more and more immunocompromised patients, largely from the medications we're giving them to treat other conditions. <clears throat> so basically, a healthcare professional may work with one patient and pass some microbe that was not causing that patient any problem onto somebody who is immunocompromised, and this causes a large problem for them. <clears throat> Other factors that, in, that are included in this, shortages of healthcare staff and overcrowded hospitals, um, the indiscriminate use of antimicrobials. And remember, I was talking in a class before about this, that it is not 
the use of antibiotics so much it's all the hand soaps that have antimicrobial agents it's farmers using uh, antibiotics without any discretion these are the things that are really dangerous and really causing a rise in the um, superbugs we're seeing a false sense of security about those antimicrobials because they're not working as well as they used to we also like to do more complicated longer surgeries which expose people to more chances of infection we are using less highly trained healthcare workers more and more um, techs medical assistants are doing things that only RNs used to do <clears throat> and RNs are doing things that only doctors used to do this does increase the risk of spreading infection uh, anti-inflammatories especially steroids and immunosuppressant drugs are on the rise and that lowers your body's immune system to fight these things one other cause that is contributing to the increase in healthcare associated infections is the overuse and improper use of indwelling devices we have more and more and more medical devices we can implant or partially implant into people and those uh, are giving bacteria viruses fungus new ways into the body <clears throat> how do we reduce these well first of all follow infection control guidelines any hospital you work at will require you to go through a whole bunch of training on infection control it will be boring it will be tedious but it's very very important hand washing is the most important issue wash your hands between patients wash your hands if you cough into them or touch your skin or anything else while you're working with patients it's a good idea anytime you walk into a room with a patient you wash your hands as you walk in and you wash your hands before you walk out your hands should be very very dry in the middle of winter if you are a healthcare provider other means of reducing the incidences include disinfecting and sterilization of all of the equipment and gear and things you're using in some cases we have to improve air filtration uh, UV lights will actually kill many infections and this is a way we actually do kill highly contagious infections in rooms isolation of uh, especially infectious page, uh, patients and also those who are exceptionally uh, susceptible wearing gloves masks gowns whatever other things uh, that are required by the way how do you wash your hands if you are not washing your hands scrubbing between the fingers and under the nails and doing it for at least 15 seconds you are not washing your hands effectively a good rule of thumb is you should be able to either sing the entire alphabet song while you are washing your hands or you should be able to do happy birthday to you twice <clears throat> infection control the numer there are a whole bunch of measures you can take to prevent infections from occurring in the health uh, healthcare settings asepsis means without infections so medical asepsis means we actually prevent direct transfer of pathogens from one person to another uh, through the air instruments bedding gowns equipment anything that's going to be contacting the patient um, surgical aseptics asepsis is what we would also call the sterile technique everything has to be sterile so there's a difference between aseptic which there aren't any pathogens and sterile which means basically there are no microbes whatsoever <clears throat> surgical aseptic techniques are used in operating rooms your book says labor and delivery areas to a degree not to the degree that they are in surgery uh, dur during invasive procedures we should also be using this catheterizations lumbar punctures things like that the difference between medical and surgical asepsis medical asepsis is clean surgical is sterile and the goal of this medical asepsis is to exclude pathogens surgical asepsis is to exclude all microbes 
standard precautions or universal precautions. These are the things all healthcare professionals should be using when dealing with body fluids of any patients. Basically, these are the guidelines for washing your hands, wearing gloves, masks, gowns, protective equipment. When you deal with a patient, you have to assume that they have every known infectious disease on the planet and they could give them all to you. And you have to treat every patient this way because you don't know which one has that infectious disease. <clears throat> Here's the list that your book uses. Hand hygiene, gloves, goggles, masks. And if you needed to see a picture of somebody wearing this, here's somebody gowning up, but not to the point of surgical asepsis. Uh, for some of you, you will actually remember the scare of Ebola from a few years ago. People were going through hospitals and clinics all over the country and all over Canada, teaching people how to appropriately use and gown up for anyone who could potentially have Ebola. This was a huge, huge, huge wake up call for medical professionals uh, to follow universal precautions. When you remove the gloves, this is an important thing. You're wearing the gloves to protect you from pathogens. You shouldn't touch the pathogen when you are removing the glove. When you remove the first glove, grab it way down by the wrist, turn it inside out, and then use the first glove to grab the second glove so you never actually touch the thing you were trying to protect yourself from in the first place. <clears throat> now, knowing how a disease is spread will actually help you determine what precautions you need to protect yourself. So the transmission-based precautions go from least severe to most severe. Contact precautions means the disease can only be caused by direct contact so you have to avoid that. Droplet means it can be found in respiratory droplets. And airborne means it can be found traveling through the air without respiratory droplets. <clears throat> so in these subject, subgroups, you can say direct contact or indirect contact. <clears throat> so things that need direct contact to spread. Uh, conjunctivitis. Acute respiratory infections, aseptic meningitis in infants and young children, chickenpox, um, shingles. These are things that you need to be worried about to the point of touch, all of the poxes. <clears throat> now, droplet precautions mean you have to use all of the same precautions, coming back two slides to... You have to cover yourself, you have to use hand hygiene, etc. But now you have to introduce the possibility that this could be spread via droplets. So now you have to not only make sure you don't directly touch this, but any, any chance that you're coming into contact with saliva or mucus or anything from the patient, that you are not spreading that as well. So the disease is requiring respiratory, the adenoviruses in infants and children, um, amophilus influenza, and all the different things that cause influenza, cause the cold, pneumonia, um, and some interesting ones, things like the measles, the German measles, SARS, strep throat, rhinovirus, Ebola, these are droplet spread. Though so Ebola has now even been seen and as being treated as an airborne because it is such a light virus, it can travel easier. <clears throat> and then the airborne precautions, everything you did for a direct contact in droplet, but now you have to put the patient into uh, isolation. You have to have special ventilation systems you have to wear personal protective equipment now that probably covers your entire body. Uh, beyond hand washing, you're also going to possibly be doing entire body washing. Now, the problem here is that some of these diseases are scarier than others. Chickenpox, I'm not going to do a full body wash when I come into contact with somebody. But Ebola, I will. <clears throat> 
tuberculosis is considered air, is considered airborne even though it is typically spread in droplets again because it is such a lightweight bacteria it travels very easily um, da -da -da. SARS and smallpox have been treated with treated as airborne diseases as well um, these also do these also require all of the droplet precautions and contact precautions we talked about this is a picture of an N95 respirator that you would use anytime airborne precautions are indicated. And then this is a picture of an isolation room where you put a patient in, and air from the hallway might come in, but air being removed is filtered. <clears throat> so this is the patient who is infected. You're letting normal air in, but you are not letting, you're filtering the air out as it leaves the room. Air here is under negative pressure, so there will be air being sucked out of this. Uh, in protective environments where you would have severely immunocompromised or immunosuppressed patients would be exactly the opposite. The air would be forced into the room through a filter and leave through normal doorways, entryways, because the positive pressure is forcing the air out. Safe handling of food and utensils requires a number of things here as well. High quality fresh food. More importantly, storing this at the proper temperature, properly washing it and cooking the food so it gets up to a hot enough temperature to d kill all of the pathogens. Getting rid of uneaten food or storing it if you're going to save it for later. In a hospital setting, we don't store it, we get rid of it. Covering your hair, wearing clean clothes and aprons, washing your hands and nails, and poten uh, potentially wearing gloves when you're handling food. Keeping cutting boards and other surfaces scrupulously clean. Um, plastic and rubber and glass cutting boards are typically better than wood ones because they don't have surfaces that bacteria can hide and multiply in. Washing, cooking, and eating utensils at high pressure and watered at over 80 degrees Celsius will kill many, many things. <clears throat> Handling fomites. These are the non-living inanimate objects we talked about before that we transmit, that could transmit microbes. It could be a stethoscope. It could be a table. It could be any tool that you're using. <clears throat> the rule of thumb here, use disposable equipment whenever you can. And the stuff that isn't disposable sterilizes as often as you can, ideally between every patient, even carrying some extra alcohol wipes to clean your stethoscopes or other equipment you might share. Uh, the thermometers need thermometer caps or covers so that you are not using the same thermometer on everybody. All right, freezing. Healthcare associated infections can add weeks to a patient's stay and could lead to death in some cases. Here's the deal insurance companies rarely reimburse for healthcare facilities or healthcare facilities for costs that are associated with the healthcare infections, and in most cases, the facility and the employees who caused it might be responsible for added costs. And susceptible to lawsuits. Healthcare associated infections can be avoided by using the proper tools, by following the rules, and using good infection control. It's every healthcare provider's responsibility to comprehend, understand, and manage their practices so they don't spread infections.